Thanks for staying with us. Well, countries around the world continue to vaccinate or immunize their citizens against the coronavirus. Well, it's that time of the year again that we reiterate the importance of vaccines. Last week, every year, the last week of uh, April in every year is set aside to celebrate World Vaccination Week or World Immunization Week, whichever one you prefer. Now, the, the week is used to promote the use of vaccines to protect people of all ages against the disease. Now, the theme for this year is vaccines bring us closer. How? Let's begin the conversation with uh, Dr. Tunji Funsho, who is chair of Rotary's Nigeria National Polio Plus Committee. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, so, first of all, over the years, vaccines, 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 how well do you, would you say vaccine has helped? Because one of the issues that you very well know, Doc, is uh, vaccine hesitancy is still an issue globally. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, opportunity for me, yes, to try as much as possible uh, in my own little way to debunk, you know, some of these uh, uh, conspiracy theories about vaccines. Um, what have vaccines done? Uh, vaccines uh, have been the, the singular weapon that has helped us to reduce uh, particularly childhood and infant mortality by almost 50% in developing you know, countries in the last uh, two decades. So we know vaccines work, they are safe. Uh, they've been around for a very, very long time. And we have shown by the uh, fact that uh, it's vaccines that we used, the oral polio vaccine, uh, and in some cases, the injectable polio vaccine that we have used, uh, in eradicating polio from Nigeria and as a consequence from the African continent. Uh, so we know it works. We also know that it is safe because we've not had any serious adverse effect as a result, you know, of polio vaccination. Uh, if you think about some of the most popularly known uh, infections in childhood, measles is the, the, apparently the most dramatic. Um, and also, it's also you know, one of the uh, diseases that also causes uh, deaths and all kinds of uh, nerve malformations, eye complications, and so on. Um, we have been able to control measles, you know, by and large using vaccines. We see the experience in the United States and parts of Europe uh, when, you know, anti-vaxxers, those are people opposed to vaccination in general, uh, started opposing, you know, uh, the, the use of the measles vaccine in their children. And we saw a resurgence of measles in the United States and Europe that they've not seen for decades. So we know vaccines work. But also now, uh, as far as COVID is concerned, uh, COVID-19 is concerned, we also know that um, they're not only uh, efficient, but they're also safe. Well, uh, we'll come to the uh, COVID-19 part in a bit. But I'm still speaking globally about um, vaccination, the practice over the years. Uh, on the one hand is the activity and the effectiveness. On the other hand, uh, the, is the, the uh, fact of producing. Now, one of the things that's come in public space about this conversation concerning vaccines or vaccination is that there are some some situations some conditions that have been with us in africa for decades but um we've not been able to develop a uh, strong enough or effective enough um uh, uh, vaccine against uh, you know against them and you might also want to mention a few of them one that readily comes to my mind is how significantly or how effectively we've been able to get a vaccine against malaria and uh, so many others like that. But we'll still talk about malaria later in the day. But that is one thing that's giving some people some concern. How come some extremely difficult conditions do not have vaccines, yet 
some others have? The, first of all, um, we must remember that the, the process of um, uh, producing vaccines is a very long, tedious, and very expensive one. Uh, and until, you know, those people living in the parts of the world where some of these diseases you've mentioned, particularly malaria, uh, have the wherewithal and also invest in providing these vaccines it will be a long way, you know, from fi finding the appropriate vaccines for, say, for instance, malaria. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to say that uh, we have a malaria vaccine currently, you know, under trial uh, and it's showing a lot of promise. But again, uh, it is not funded from, you know, uh, the malaria part of the world. It's been funded, you know, from uh, countries that don't have, you know, cases of malaria. Pharmaceutical companies uh, have an interest in ensuring that their shareholders get returns on their investment. So we must never forget that. So until such a time that we invest, those of us in the part of the world that have some of these diseases that you're mentioning, until we start to invest uh, in the uh, production, in the research and production of vaccines, will be a long way, you know, from, you know, getting all of these vaccines. We used to have uh, 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 a vaccine production center in, in Yaba uh, some three, four decades ago, uh, if call, uh, which has gone moribund. Uh, it's a, like I said, it's an expensive venture, uh, and therefore, if uh, if governments don't really invest, it will be very difficult to find uh, pharmaceutical companies who will invest in in something that they don't see uh, much profit so coming out of it. Uh, both in the medium and long term. Very interesting. Um, seeing that, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm trying to check now. I don't know if we have such a condition, such a vaccine for HIV/AIDS as well, which was uh, kind of um, you know as serious back in time. But you know, talking about you know uh, profit for the big pharma and all of that, there are quite a number of. Uh, conditions in our part of the world, for instance, that continue to, you know, um, affect us every year. It's like there's a, there's a, there's a season or there's a weather that some of them come up. And over the years, and is it because the, it's not profitable for the big farmer, you know, or global big farmer, or that the countries themselves, African countries in particular, are not willing to take them on. Take Lassa fever, for instance. And I, I don't even want to go into the figures of the fatalities of Lassa fever over the years. Ebola is still somewhere late and somewhere, God forbid, that it comes up again. So what is really the, beside this, the profit end? Isn't there something governments of Africa could be able to do to stem this tide? Definitely, definitely. There, there, are, there are resources in Africa. Uh, there are development you know, organizations like, you know, like the African Development Bank, for instance. Um, we, we, just need, we just need the will uh, to, to make a conscious decision. Uh, having learned, you know, from our current experience, you know, with uh, uh, begging, uh, cap in hand, you know, for COVID-19 vaccine and waiting until, you know, those, you know, who have invested, you know, uh, in the vaccines long ahead of us, you know, get their feel before we get the crumbs, you know, from their tables. Um, I think, you know, there's a, 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 an urgent need for, for, my, for an initiative coming out of Africa you know, the tackles, you know, some of these uh, uh, diseases with vaccines. But that is not to say that, you know, it's easy to, uh, to provide vaccine for, for every disease. There are also, you know, technical uh, hurdles uh, that prevent, you know, certain diseases uh, being amenable uh, to use by vaccines because uh, the, the, the infecting agent is not stable. In other words, uh, as we have seen with COVID-19, you have one variant, you produce a vaccine against it, and within a short period of time, that variant, uh, in an attempt to survive the onslaught against it, you know, mutates uh, and now produce a new creature that you now need to produce another vaccine, you know, against, you know. So sometimes, you know, there are technical uh, uh, issues that uh, bedevils the production of vaccines for 
certain kind of diseases. But there are quite a number that uh, with uh, a lot of investment, you know, uh, uh, the will, uh, particularly, you know, political will uh, on the part of governments in Africa uh, to, to bring resources together and tackle those uh, common diseases that uh, afflict our people, that this thing can be done. And I think, you know, uh, there's, a, there's quite a bit of discussion already going on now in view of, you know, our humiliation as regards um, consignments of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Humiliation, interesting word, doctor. But um, let, let me take you back on, on, take you up on what you mentioned about the mutation of those viruses. It's something that science knew would happen. And as a result of that, some people are even, there is a number of, they, they, there are some opinions out there, some hypotheses, some theories out there by some people that look, if I still have to take all the precautions that I need to, that I needed to take before taking the vaccines, after I take the vaccines, then what's the point of taking the vaccines? Well, um, yes. Uh, and sometimes, you know, people uh, express these opinions and take things uh, out of context. Number one, uh, controlling an epidemic disease is a public health issue. It's not an individual issue. In other words, you're not just thinking about one individual. You're talking about, you know, a population particularly those populations that are close together, say in a town, or in a village, or in a country. Uh, so uh, if you take the COVID-19 vaccine, um, you are protected against you know, falling ill uh, as a result of the immunity that the vaccine confers on you. But it does not stop you know, the virus getting to you and replicating, for instance, in your upper nasal passages. If you do not wear a mask, people around you stand the risk of being infected by you if they are not fully immunized. This is why we're talking about getting to herd immunity. And when we get to a point where about 65 to 70 percent of the population are fully immunized, then the need for these precautions will now start to wane and the authorities will now give guidelines as to uh, what and what we need to do. But until such a time that you are sure that the person you're meeting uh, is immunized, uh, you're a danger to that person. Uh, that is, that is a, the most important reason why uh, we ask to continue uh, observing these protocols. Again, if you wear a mask, then the risk of getting this virus into your upper respiratory passage that you might use in infecting somebody else is taken care of. So those are the two basic reasons. The vaccine protects you, but we want the environment protected. We want those who have not been immunized protected as well, because this is a public health issue. It is not an individual issue. Uh, until such a point, like I said, we get to the critical mass of what we call herd immunity, that enough number of people have been immunized that the virus will not find any host where it can settle and cause disease. We have to continue observing these protocols. Uh, let me also take you back on, take you up on that word you used uh, earlier national embarrassment of sorts concerning the, the, the vaccines, you know. And uh, you also mentioned, and everybody knows it, that we had a vaccine production system back in time. What happened, if you can hazard a guess, or if there is something you know that you want to tell us? And what do we need to do to never get back there? Because you very well know that some people are already positing that. This is not going to be the last pandemic. Oh, definitely. Um, this pandemic was, was uh, uh, predicted um, about a decade or more ago uh, because you can see the trend. It's not difficult to predict these things. I mean, pandemics are not new to, uh, to human society. Um, 
Now, I, I don't know precisely, you know, what happened to our vaccine production unit uh, in Lagos. Uh, but you see, uh, like I mentioned earlier with regard to vaccine production, uh, I don't think the government, there's no government anywhere that uh, produces vaccines. Vaccines are produced by the private sector because there has to be some form of inducement and motivation uh, and continuity. Uh, you know, in this country and, and in most of Africa, you know, our governments are notorious for lack of continuity, either because of, you know, because party changes and usually that's the reason. Uh, and the new government decides to go in a different trajectory entirely, both at the state and national level. So it would be important, you know, for government can be a catalyst to start the, the movement, you know, for the private sector, you know, to come on board. And like they're doing for other, you know, parts of our manufacturing sector, give them incentives, give them tax breaks but also, you know, assure them of a market. Because if, if, uh, if uh, you ask a company to produce, you know, uh, vaccines and, and they put in a lot of investment, as I said, it's, you know, there's a huge cost, you know, into research and development of vaccine. So if we, if we ensure that we provide that enabling environment for the private sector to take things up, they want to make money. So they'll, they'll come in there. Uh, so basically, uh, is to is to say that government should not be in the business of uh, production. Government should be in the business of enabling production by the private sector. And I think we've seen a lot of uh, very fruitful example in other areas, you know, uh, economy when the government you know provides an enabling environment for entrepreneurs, you know, in the private sector to to come in and produce. Well, we, it's, a, it's a fine place to leave that conversation, Dr. Funcha. We do thank you very much for your perspectives and wish you all the best in further endeavors. Dr. Tunji Funcha is chair of Rotary's Nigeria National Polio Plus Committee. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, thank you very much for having me. Just to remind people to continue immunizing their children against all the childhood preventable diseases. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right, then. So we take a break and we'll be right back.